I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a Living Memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's Story Survive program with Doreen Grunbaum, a child survivor of the Vesterbork and Bergen-Belsen concentration camps. Doreen will, will share her story with us today. And then I'll interview Doreen and share some images and documents from Doreen's family, uh, which have been given to the museum's collection over the years. We'll conclude with an audience Q&A. So please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box throughout the program, and we'll address as many as we can at the end. Without further ado, welcome Doreen. We're so grateful that you're with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start my talk with uh, a talk that I gave a few years ago. It was the first time that I had spoken publicly about the, the Holocaust, my Holocaust experience. Um, and, you'll, and so I'm gonna read this talk uh, because my memories are very few about it. I'm almost 79 years old. And so I was a very small child during the time of my, my, uh, my time in, in Vesterbork and Berger Belsen. So um, I'll read the talk and then we'll talk. I was close to three when my, when my parents my maternal grandmother and I were liberated by Russian soldiers from what is known as the lost transport, one of the trains that the Germans packed with sick and dying inmates from Bergen-Belsen. It was becoming clear to the Germans that they were going to lose the war and they wanted to empty the camp of as many people as possible while at the same time hoping that allied bombs would hit the trains. While Theresienstadt was its intended destination, the lost transport crisscrossed Germany for two weeks. It was mostly cattle cars and a few passenger cars for mothers with small children, including my mother, my elderly grandmother, and my very sick father. Until the train was stopped by the Russians on April 23rd, 1945, outside of Trubitz, a small town in East Germany. I have a memory of lying in a luggage net above my mother in that train, which is where the small children were rocked to sleep. My mother wrote many years later that the benches in the train were hard and uncomfortable and she had to watch for splinters. The windows were dirty and locked and because people around us were unwashed, many of them sick or dying, there was a constant terrible stench. Once a day, the train stopped so dead bodies could be removed and buried if there was time. Or from time to time, the train would stop abruptly because of overhead air fights between the Germans and the Allies. Everyone would be ordered off the trains, throwing themselves on the ground and covering their heads with their food bowls. Occasionally, people would sneak off to nearby nearby farms where they either stole or were given food, sometimes coming back with potatoes or vegetables. If the train had stopped long enough, they could manage to build a small fire, enough to cook the treasures. But most people became sick after eating because they couldn't digest this kind of food anymore. So they got terrible diarrhea afterwards. My mother also told how sometimes there was fighting in the train. Starving people stole food from each other. Raw turns, sometimes a chunk of bread. But after a while, there were those who started telling stories to pass the time, or you could hear Yiddish songs, especially when the children were being put to sleep. Maybe that's why I've always loved Yiddish music. But that's not my first memory. Still in Bergen-Belsen, probably a few weeks before that, I have a memory of being lifted to my father's top level bunk bed. Like many others in the overcrowded filthy barracks, he had contracted spotted typhus and had almost died. Now he was in a hospital barrack, about 80 pounds, half his normal weight and slowly recovering, but not able to walk or to do any work. My memory is of a dark room of sitting high, on my father's top bunk bed 
and then being lifted down to the floor where I left by walking around and over bodies on the floor. Throughout their lives, whenever the war was mentioned, my parents and my grandmother repeated to me again and again that without me, they could never have survived Bergen-Belsen. Here's what happened. You may know that in May 1940, Rotterdam was bombed beyond recognition by the Nazis. My parents tried to escape various times, but they didn't succeed. They even discussed suicide over and over, but each time they changed their minds, thinking it would always be an option later. Over time, as Jews, their rights were restricted as more and more anti-Jewish laws were enacted. But by 1942, my mother was pregnant with me. Many of their friends were having babies and my mother had somehow become more optimistic thinking that the war had to be over soon. So I was 13 months on September 29th, 1943, the night my father was awoken by a loud knock on the door. Two young Nazi soldiers and a Dutch police officer asked for my parents and my grandmother's identity cards and then ordered them to be ready to leave in 30 minutes. The suitcases had been prepared months before. One of the young German soldiers told my father that he had just been ordered to leave his studies and appear for army duty. He was upset about it and advised my mother to bring my father to bring along biscuits and condensed milk which he did. The Dutch police officer said they wouldn't need it. My father piled the, <clears throat> piled the suitcases in the, bar in the baby carriage while my mother held me and with my grandmother, they walked to the police station followed closely by the three Nazis. At the police station, they recognized many of their friends among the crowd. As they stood waiting to get on the bus, my father realized that my name was not on the list. He saw that a woman was standing on the side next to the chief of police, whom my father knew. She had been mistakenly arrested. She was not Jewish after all. So suddenly, my father asked the chief of police if he could give her his baby to bring to his close non-Jewish friends, the Biermann family. The chief thought for a moment and then agreed. My father wrote down their address and with the baby carriage, he handed me over to the lady. My mother and grandmother were numb and in shock. My father, probably numb himself, spoke softly to them, trying to assure them and himself that he had made the right decision. Most of the passengers were now on the bus and it was preparing to leave. My father ran to the still open door to check on me. What he saw was a screaming baby surrounded by a dozen Nazi soldiers. He jumped off the bus, grabbed me, ran back on the bus and put me on my mother's lap. He later wrote, that was probably the main reason that we're all still alive. The Germans would have known where Doreen was because of course they knew where the lady lived. They would have taken Doreen and sent her to Auschwitz or to, and to the gas chamber or they would have given her to a German family to make a German child out of her. Rita would have not have had the strength, Rita's my mother, Rita would not have had the strength to survive in Westerbork or Bergen-Belsen, and neither would I probably have. Rita would have had to work instead of being able to care for the baby and would have been physically broken. That's the end of the quote. When we first arrived in Bergen-Belsen after six months in Westerbork in Northern Holland, there were 120 people in one barrack. By the time we left, there were 500 people. When we first arrived, there was a total of 4,000 prisoners in Bergen-Belsen. When we left, there were 60,000. There were no gas chambers. There was a crematorium to burn the bodies of those who had died, mostly from typhoid, typhus, bitter cold, or starvation. My mother told me that from time to time she would take me for a walk down a path with mountains of bodies piled on one side. It was normal to me. 
I didn't know what I was seeing. Everything was normal to me. And I was never separated from my little world. I was never away from my mother and slept in a bed with her every night. My grandmother slept nearby and I could see my father almost every day. I had friends and we played with whatever we could find. When I finally spoke, my first word was Achtung, the German word that screamed for attention. So now returning to the lost transport, our Russian liberators in Trubitz were kind to us. And here's a quote from my mother. The Russians allowed us to take anything we needed from the Germans, which was everything. Anybody who could walk went. That night, we slept in wonderful beds with clean white sheets, blankets, and real pillows. It was much more than the attic room we had dreamed of. The next morning, my mother had typhus with a high fever for three days. My memory is that I'm standing terrified at the foot of an enormous bed as my mother is lying unconscious, eyes closed, not moving, not hearing me cry. By then, I knew what dead meant, and I thought she was dead. But after three weeks, my mother was better, and then my father, still weak from his earlier typhus, came down with it again. And actually, I'm not sure whether it was typhus or typhoid at that point. I don't know if you can get typhoid, typhus twice. He was moved to the new hospital that the Russians had organized, and my mother was not allowed to visit him. They stayed in contact through smuggled notes, my father instructing my mother what to do in case he didn't pull through, but he did. So on July 1st, 1945, our, our family, my parents, my grandmother and I, were on the last transport to leave Trebitz for Leipzig, which was about an hour away, and from there to Maastricht, Holland, by ambulance because of my father's weak condition. I'm left with my grandmother in a large crowd of people when suddenly I can't find her. I look all around and then make my way through the crowd searching and crying. Finally, a kind man recognizes me, picks me up and takes me back to my frantic grandmother. And one last quote from my mother. A few days later, while Fred was still in the hospital, our dear, dear friend, Gerrit Biermann, from Rotterdam suddenly stood before him, before me. And remember it had been his family's address that, that my father had given to the woman at the police station. Gerrit had traveled on a milk truck having discovered that, my, that we were alive. He traveled on a milk truck to find us. Here was this tall, wonderful man putting his arms around me, asking us to come and stay with him, to, with them until we found a place of our own. That's the end of the quote. We did that, and I have vivid memories of the following two months when we lived with the family that my father had thought to send me to, but didn't. Only 5% of Dutch Jews survived the war. Our family, part of the last group to be rounded up in Holland, was among them. That's the end. Maureen, thank you so much for sharing your memories with us. There's so much that you do remember, a striking amount given your age, and so much clearly that you don't, but um, that we're fortunate to be able to build, you know, build a story around and understand through you. I'm gonna- and I just wanna say that um, a lot of the information comes from the, uh, the accounts that my parents both wrote, I think in the early days before email and everything, there was a lot of writing and um, since I had um, a whole family, my father's whole family had, had gone to Mexico, he wrote for them particularly, um, so they knew what, so they would know what we had been through. And also uh, he wrote later for me and for my sister, Judy, who was born after the war in Brooklyn, um, so that we would know because my memories were actually so few. Where today are the, the pieces of writing that your parents produced about their experiences? Are they just documents that, that you have at home? Um, they're in my file cabinet. Wow. Keep them safe. <laughs> um, Doreen, you were 13 months old when 
your, your first sent to Vesterbork with your family, and then almost three when you were liberated. Given that young age and how little you remember, do you identify as a Holocaust survivor? I do now, certainly, and really I always did. I always knew that, I always knew about the Holocaust. I always knew where I had been. Um, even though I, I was not able to put together a story at all, I, I had words in my head, Bergen Bells and Vesterbork, um, you know, uh, turnips. I had words that I knew and that I knew were related to where I had been, but um, I had nothing to say. I had no memory. And so I identified more as a child of survivors because I was a child of survivors as well as a survivor. But I, um, I always knew that there was something different and I was always aware of that. And uh, uh, growing up, it was a little bit lonely because I didn't have anybody to share that with. It, it, sharing, I couldn't share that with my parents because my parents remembered everything. And so, um, and they had friends who, survivors also, who they knew from the camps. And so they had a community to share with. I didn't have anything like that. So I didn't even know what I was looking for. I just knew that I didn't fit in with any of it. When we were speaking earlier, you said something really poignant that a lot of your confusion was really loneliness. Yeah. Stuck with me. Yeah. I want to pull up some photos. We're very lucky that your mother, Rita, donated some of your family's photos and documents to the museum's collection in the 1990s. So I'm going to pull up some photos and ask you questions about what, about what we're seeing. Um, here we have a, a adorable image of you as a baby before your family was um, sent to Vester Bork. Uh, how much do you know about what your family's life was like in, in these very early years? Were, were, you, were they religious Jews? Can you tell us about your parents' business? Um, I would say they were not religious Jews, although my mother had grown up in an Orthodox, uh, with an Orthodox father. And so in their house, they kept kosher and they were fairly religious. I don't know uh, if my mother attended synagogue or anything like that. I don't know about that. But I do know that um, outside of her house, um, she, was, she was not particularly religious at all. Ate whatever she wanted to eat, um, had, did not go to Jewish schools. Uh, so her friends were Jewish and not Jewish. And, um, and I think that actually is something that my life has been like that as well. And so, um, uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I can't remember where I'm going with that. But anyway, my father, my father had come to, to Holland in 1932. His father had um, lost his business being Jewish. And so my father came to Holland in order to earn money to send back to his, his parents. And so he uh, worked in the grain business always, importing and exporting grain. And um, my mother was a social worker. Um, uh, she worked particularly with children. And so, uh, and they met at a party and fell in love. You said your father came to the Netherlands in 1932. That was from Germany? Yes, from Frankfurt. That's striking that in 1932 was before Hitler came to power, but he was already experiencing enough anti-Semitism to want to flee. He was, and my father actually, you know, I've tried to get citizenship from Holland, from Germany, from various places. And it, I know it's ironic to think that I would try to get citizenship from, from Germany, but um, of all the places where I've tried to get a second citizenship, Germany has been the most, the most helpful and the most willing to help. And I'm very grateful to that. And, but, I, but I haven't been able to get it. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, 
And, and, I, and you might ask, why do I feel like I need a second citizenship? And that is, I think, because I feel um, vulnerable. I've always, I've always felt like it was safer to have a, another citizenship. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, sorry. Another older image um, reflecting your family's life before the war. This is your, your mother's mother, the same grandmother who was with you in the camps. Is that right? Yes. So, Can you talk about her? Yes. Um, she was my Omi. Um, she is seated on the right. Uh, and next to her is her brother, Yaakov. And next to him is their sister, Berta. And then on the left is their half-sister, uh, Millie. Uh, and Millie was born, uh, their, their mother, the three on the right, their mother died in a fire and their father married again and then Millie was born. So um, my grandmother was a great person. Um, she uh, came to Holland and worked in a business that was already established, um, the family business. Uh, it was a department store called Herzom. And um, she worked as the, from the age of 14, I think. She was never good in school. And so they, they didn't know what to do with her. So they sent her to, to the business. And, um, and she rose to become the director of the Rotterdam branch of Herzom. And for me, she was, uh, she was a, a pillar in my life. Um, I think we, we shared a kind of sense of humor that um, the rest of my family didn't share. My mother was uh, a pretty serious person. My father was actually had a wonderful sense of humor, but it was different than my grandmother's. And so, um, and I loved my grandmother a lot and I think she loved me a lot. I know she did, yeah. So she was with us during the whole time that we were in, uh, in the camp concentration camps. Now, why were your other grandparents not with you? They passed away by the time you were rounded up? Um, both of my grandfathers had passed away. Um, my other grandmother, Flora, Flo, um, had been living in Germany with, um, with my aunt and her husband, Kurt, my aunt Laura and my, her husband, Kurt. And um, they had left Germany when things started looking bad in Germany and they had lived in other parts of Europe. Uh, and, there, and my two cousins from there, Rolf and uh, Ruth, uh, lived in Holland with, at least Ruth lived in Holland with my parents for some time, for a time. And then um, I would say, I can't remember the exact date. I'm sorry, I don't have it in my head. But just before Hitler came to Holland, um, that family left Europe. And my parents went with them to Antwerp and to see them off on the boat. And it turned out that was the last boat that could get out. And so they ended up uh, first in the States and then they moved to Mexico, which was a very open country for immigrants and refugees, very open at the time. And for many years before that, was known for that. Do you know if your parents considered joining them on that boat? Um, my father didn't want to go. He said, if Hitler comes, we're, I'm going to fight. Mm. He was a very loyal Dutch citizen mm. by then. So, and they, and they certainly didn't expect what, what, what happened who could have. He did, right. So Kurt and, and Lori, who ended up in Mexico City, um, were able to provide documentation, um, uh, emigration certificates to Palestine that, that proved really important in securing your family better treatment once you were in the camps. Can you tell us what you know about that? Um, Kurt, was, Kurt re was able to get 
um, documents to allow my our, our family to go to Palestine, and and he was able to get those documents to my father in Vesterborg, which was the first camp where we were, and so my father had those documents, and when we were transported to Bergen Belsen, those documents allowed us to be in the barrack, or the section of Bergen Belsen where we were. There were several different sections of Bergen Belsen, the largest of it, of them were, uh, was the one that we were in. It was called the Sternlager, and which means the star camp. And the reason it was called that was because in all the other, in most of the other sections, people were required to wear the striped uniforms that you see in photographs. But in the Sternlager, we were allowed to wear our own clothes, uh, but we had to wear the star. And so that was, it was called the star camp. And so um, we received better treatment at the beginning in that camp. Um, I think better food, better, better everything. Um, later, as, as the camp filled up with more and more prisoners, things deteriorated. And, um, and you heard from, the, from my talk that there wasn't enough. So it, it's, it's interesting to me that the papers you had that were allowed you to emigrate to Palestine were, they didn't allow you to leave the camp, but the fact that you had them was, it, was able to secure you better treatment in the camp or, or access to that special section. I mean, I wonder if it in some ways reflects sort of the evolution of Nazi racial policy, which it started um, with deportations and, and ended with extermination. Hmm. I don't. I don't know about that. I don't know. I, I haven't thought about that. But I, the the papers uh, were meant as an exchange. So the the papers would have allowed us to be exchanged for a German prisoner who was who wanted to return back or who was sent back to Germany. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think so. Everybody in that group had some way of leaving. Uh, of leaving to another country. And I think most of it was to Palestine. Um, but um, it turned out, my mother said, and I, I guess it's true, that German press prisoners didn't want to be exchanged, didn't want to come back. Hmm. And so that exchange, I, I'm not sure if that's the reason the exchange really never happened, but it never happened. Let's look at a couple documents from your time in Vesterbork and then Bergen-Belsen. This is your ID card with this, again, adorable image of you as a small child. And this is Vesterbork on the upper left. Right, so this, is, this was my ID card from Vesterbork, yeah. And then here we have a letter from the Red Cross um, announcing that your family had been registered on the exchange list for Palestine. And this is a, a pretty interesting document because it's actually in English. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think that is the exchange document, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that I was talking about. Yeah. And then in addition to securing you the uh, exchange papers for Palestine, your cousins Kurt and Lori in Mexico City also sent uh, packages. Um, so this package contains sugar, milk powder, cocoa, rice, and salt. And you can see right on the front that it was sent to you in Bergen-Belsen, which is uh, really striking. Yes. And uh, I was actually surprised also that we, and I had heard about it before and have always been surprised that we were able to get that package, but we did. Yes. And I'm not exactly sure what, uh, at, what were the dates of that, so I don't know if it was earlier when things seemed a little bit um, less severe or if we received it later in our time there. I, I don't know that. Hmm. It says your, your, your father's last name here is spelled G-R-U-E-N-B-A-U-M. Was the spelling changed over time? Yeah, well, um, it was originally Grunbaum with, a, with an umlaut. Hmm. And so that's, that U-E is the umlaut. And when, um, and he spelled it that way in Holland also, but when we came to the United States, he dropped the umlaut. Hmm. 
Um, now, this to me is the most emotional of these documents. Can you tell us about it? Uh, well, um, when we were liberated, um, this text was sent to, um, who was it sent to? My aunt? My More of Edwards in the Bronx, it looks like. Well, honestly, I don't know who Moritz Edwards is. No, I, I don't know how he found out that we had survived, but apparently he did. And um, so, and he was asked by my father, I guess, to send um, this uh, information to my uncle Zigurd and to my relatives in Mexico. My uncle Zigurd was my mother's brother who had um, come to Los Angeles um, before the war and uh, was in the army, the American army, and not sent abroad. And, um, and then returned to Los Angeles where he worked for Douglas Aircraft for many years. I can only imagine the emotion of your relatives receiving this letter after hearing probably little news from Europe and not being sure what had happened to you. Yes. Um, and then here's their response to, from Mexico to you saying, over happy with joy, all our thoughts with you. How can we help? Right. Short and to the point. Right. So, uh, yes. Yes. So your family, you mentioned that you stayed with another family for a couple months while you got back on your feet in the Netherlands, and then you emigrated to the United States. Can you walk us through how you got from the Netherlands to eventually to Los Angeles? Oh, to Los Angeles? Wow. Okay, that's a lot of years. <laughs> um, so, uh, so our family did um, immigrate. And I say immigrate because um, I don't think we were exactly refugees when we came to the United States. My father, uh, my father's old boss had left Holland before the war and um, had discovered from lists that my father was alive. And so immediately he sent my father um, an offer to come to New York to work in his business. So when we immigrated, we immigrated because my father <clears throat> was not a refugee. He had work waiting for him. <clears throat> and so, uh, we came over on a boat that, um, in 1946, that landed in Galveston. We didn't go through Ellis Island. And uh, we landed in Galveston because it was close to Mexico. And we stayed uh, with a friend, an old friend of my father's uh, in Houston for a few days. And then we got on a boat. I, actually, I'm saying that I'm not sure how we got to Mexico. Mm. Um, but then we went to Mexico and we stayed there for several months um, to be with my father's family. Uh, after that, we went to um, Los Angeles to be with my uncle and stayed there for a little while. And then my father was original, his original placement was in Pittsburgh. The, the company also had an office in Pittsburgh. And uh, we lived in Pittsburgh for a short while, but that would, did not work for my father who had asthma. And the air in from Pittsburgh was quite bad. And so we moved to New York, to Brooklyn. And we lived in Brooklyn. Um, later, we moved to Larchmont, New York. And um, that's where I grew up and went to school. And after college, I, um, and during college, I spent a year in Israel and then later joined the Peace Corps and lived in Turkey for two years. Um, and then, you know, I was, we came back from Turkey. I was very involved in the anti-war movement. I was, um, I, I, I worked as a, a teacher of English as a second language. Oops. I'm getting a scam. Um, and then I, um, I met my husband 
who, uh, my first husband, who was a British Israeli. And at the time he was living in Israel where he had lived for a long time. And he um, got a job in Los Angeles. So we moved to Los Angeles. And yeah. I'm gonna pull up just a couple more photos um, because there's so many beautiful ones of this, this chapter of your story. So here's your family right after war in July, 1945 outside of Rotterdam. Yeah. Yeah, this photograph uh, moves me every time I see it. Um, we, it was immediate, this was the street where the Biermann family lived who, and we lived with that family. Um, and you can see that my mother and I look pretty normal um, because um, my mother had recovered from having been sick and uh, we had been fed and, but my father was, if he was fully recovered, he was shortly fully recovered and he was still, I think, close to the 80 pounds that he had uh, become. And so my father looks terrible. Yeah. Dorian, when we spoke, you mentioned that you thought this might be in Mexico, but it looks like our museum records yeah. show this as being still in Rotterdam before you left the yeah. United States. Yeah, I think that's right. So as first you can see my father in a much better state than, mm -hmm. than in the earlier photo. And um, so this would have been just before we left for the United States. And um, we were, this was the porch of the Biermann family. And um, yeah. I'm just gonna go back and forth to the previous one to look at your father, one year of recovery between these images. Yeah. And then this is our last image. I think it's so, so beautiful. Just from that brief stay that you had in Houston, three generations of your family. Yeah, yeah. How long did your grandmother live after you made it to Mexico or the United States? Uh, my mother, my grandmother lived to be 91, so she died in 1972. And when you were growing up in Larchmont, how much did your parents and your grandmother talk about what you had experienced during the Holocaust? Um, I, I wouldn't say that they talked about it, but it was never a taboo subject. So, I mean, it was um, kind of in, in the, you know, when we were in concentration camp, we did something or other. So that was, it was just occasional uh, and, or, oh, we're having turnip. No, oh no, we never make turnips because we had that in concentration camp. Oh, or um, oh, I know these people from Vesterbork. So it was um, just thrown into the conversation, but there were never accounts really of what happened. That's how, I grew up with those words in my head, but not really a story in my head. And um, as I got older, I became obviously more aware of that story, but um, I, I, I didn't ask many questions. The, the Holocaust became kind of a backdrop in my life because uh, when we came, when we moved to Larchmont, a few years after we moved there, my father started showing symptoms of MS, multiple sclerosis. And that was, that became a, uh, a driving change in our lives. My, and my sister also had a lot of emotional problems because of my father's illness because of being the only member of the family who had not participated in the big story, the Holocaust. So she was a child of survivors, uh, literally. And um, so there were other things going on. And my mother, of course, was the, the bearer of all of this difficulty and had to figure it out. And so the Holocaust, um, became receded, not in importance, but in conversation or in 
in anything for, for quite some time. You mentioned to me that you had a, a transformative meeting with someone named Frank Epstein, who had a similar experience to you later in life. Uh, we'd love to hear more about that. And was that sort of the, the turning point when the Holocaust became more important for you? Well, I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit for that, because actually um, in the 70s, when I was in my mid 30s, I had a very close friend, um, a boyfriend, uh, who my mother was very fond of. And um, he was a, a novelist. His name was Jerry Badanis. And he uh, was writing a novel in which one of the characters was a child Holocaust survivor. So he um, one day started asking my mother questions, very pointed, very specific questions. And to my great surprise, she started answering every single one of them. And so this was the first time I, I heard details of, of this kind that were just amazing to me. And so it was from this point on that I started being more curious and, and uh, realizing that I, I, I needed information that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. so, and then as time went on, I got that information. And Frank Epstein um, came into the picture uh, a few years ago. Um, maybe more than a few, maybe five years ago, I'm, I, five or six years ago. Um, my sister who was living in Boston and um, was disabled by many things, but was very persistent and very brilliant and very determined uh, around the Holocaust. Had, my sister had met Frank um, at, through some friends and realized that Frank had been in all the same places that I had been, that our family had been. And he was exactly my age. So they became friends and Frank at one point went to visit my mother uh, to find out more information. And, but I had never met him and I was actually, he was, he was just a name to me. I, I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. I was living in Los Angeles, but at one day I was in uh, Boston and um, I was in the kitchen and my sister, I heard her talking on the telephone. So she had called somebody. And if, uh, after a while she said to me, Doreen, somebody wants to talk to you. She didn't say who. And so I picked up the phone and it was Frank Epstein. And probably she had said to him, somebody wants to talk to you. And so, um, and we talked a little bit and, and I realized I really did want to meet this person when I, when I understood that we had had the same experience. So the next day we met at a coffee shop for breakfast. And I think we must have talked the entire morning. We just talked for hours and it was incredibly comforting to me, incredibly comforting to finally meet somebody who was my peer. And that has made a big difference for me in my life. Frank, um, actually, I wasn't the first person that he had met because he knew somebody else. And I'm just gonna show you this book written by Joseph Pollock, and that was the somebody else. And um, Joseph had written a book called After the Holocaust, The Bells Still Ring. And it described his family's experience. But again, he was in all the same places that we were. So it, I, I finally felt that I had a community, tiny as it was. It was a very important community. And I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can just um, add something now. Should I add something now about Nikki? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, we, there, there, there was this, a family that my parents were very close to in the camps. And this was the Melkman family. And they were also Dutch and um, 
and they survived the war as well. And they had, uh, uh, well, at the time that we were all picked up, they were in a train to Vesterborg, I believe, and they had, they had a son who was my age or a year older than me. And they had made the very difficult decision of placing their son with a Christian family because they knew what was going to happen. So they were in this train with papers for their son, Avraham. And sitting in the train with them was a woman and her son. And the woman was very upset because she didn't have papers for her son. Her son's name was Nikki. And so the Melkmans said, well, we'll hold on to him. We'll, we'll pretend he's our son because we have papers and we have, and our son is not here. And so they arrived in, uh, in Vesterborg, all of them. And very shortly after, Nikki's mother was sent to Sobibor and was killed there. So Nikki spent the whole war with the Melkman family. And Nikki was my playmate in, in the in Bergen-Belsen. So I, had, I knew about Nikki and I knew about the Melkmans. And much later, uh, when I was in college, I spent a year at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, every Friday, every Shabbat, the Melkman family invited me to come to their house to, to have Shabbat with them. So there they were with their, they now had a second son. Avraham had been recovered um, and they had a second son, Dan. And there was this third son, Nikki, who wasn't actually their son, it was their foster son. And so I, I, I had a sense, a feeling about Nikki. We each knew about each other, but we never really talked. And actually much later, Nikki, um, after, after liberation, Nikki had been claimed by his aunt back in Holland. So she, he went to live with his aunt. And then after that, spent many years in homes, in uh, children's homes and uh, had a very unhappy life really. And so when the war ended and the Melkmans uh, after a while had um, immigrated to Israel, Nikki stayed in Holland for quite some time but eventually immigrated also to Israel and then became close to the Melkmans again. And um, so I had this relationship with Nikki all through many years when I uh, returned to, to Holland, I always saw him and, um, but he was never really able to talk. Mm. So um, I have, he, he was never, really a, a companion in the way that Frank became when I was much older and also more yeah. able to talk. So yeah, that was the story of Nikki. Thanks for sharing, Doreen. We'll, we'll turn to some of the audience questions now. Um, M. Greenwood is asking, what are your attitudes towards the Germans and Dutch today? And how do you feel about your own national identity? Do you identify as Dutch? I do. I, I grew up speaking Dutch. My family, my parents spoke Dutch to us always. And, um, and I go to Holland. I, well, before the pandemic, I went to Holland often. Um, um, I, I spent many, I used to go to Holland every summer to visit my grandmother who still lived there. And um, so I, and I visited, and I always stayed with the Biermann family. And um, I have friends in Holland. And so I still have a, a strong feeling and a loyalty to Holland, which I know was not, Holland was quite imperfect to Jews, uh, I found out later. But um, yeah. I, I, it's familiar, Holland is familiar to me. The language is familiar, everything is familiar to me. And do you have any relatives there now? Um, 
No, I don't have relatives, but I have two close friends, one Jewish and one not Jewish. Mm. Yeah. Someone in the audience named Helen writes, it restores your faith in humanity to hear of all the people, both family and friends who helped your family. It's true, there are a lot of good figures in, in your story. Um, in addition to the Biermans, there's of course her cousins in Mexico. Did you keep up, keep up a relationship with them? Yes, I mean, you know, I, um, I have a very large uh, group of cousins in Mexico. I have also a cousin in um, Connecticut uh, whom I'm close to, but um, yes, I often went to Mexico to visit. I spent um, about six months in Mexico uh, during the 70s. And uh, I'm close to many of my cousins, yes. We don't see each other that much anymore now because of the circumstances, but but we are definitely in touch and I feel close to them, yes. That's wonderful. Yes. Uh, Sandra in the audience is asking if there were any long-term health issues uh, that your family experienced from malnutrition and, and disease in the camp. Uh, you were so young, Does it, it? do you feel that your time being in the camp impacted you physically or psychologically? <laughs> um, I will, I'll just start by saying that my father's MS um, was thought to have been much uh, exacerbated by the fact that we were in concentration camps and may have even started there. And so my mother luckily was able to get doctor's um, verification about that. And then uh, my father's uh, care was paid for by, by the Germans. So yes. And what was the second part of your question? Oh, whether I have any long-term. Um, if you feel comfortable sharing it, that's a person. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, you know, I have a broken ankle at the moment, but I don't think that was because of that. <laughs> well, we wish you a speedy recovery of your ankle. Marina in Mexico writes, much loves you from Mexico. Thank you, Doreen. So it looks like you're a present. Stephen in the audience is asking if you ever considered Israeli citizenship, given all the time you spent there and your quest for two citizenships. No, I never did. Um, my son, um, who is 37, um, uh, lives in Israel. And so, and he lives there because I don't, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say that he moved there because of, um, strong Zionist or Israeli feelings. Uh, I, I believe he moved there because he has three uh, half brother, a brother and two half sisters whom we've always stayed very close to, and he was, who lived there and he wanted to try something different. So he went to Israel and stayed there, he became a journalist and married an American also, and has a baby, a little boy. That's Alto on, on your grandson. Um, I have two more questions and then, and then we'll wrap up. Can you explain in brief what the process has been like of trying to secure German citizenship? I know it's something that a lot of descendants of survivors either navigate or consider navigating, but it's complicated. I will say that um, here in Los Angeles, I've received tremendous help from and support from um, the consulate here. Uh, my case is particular is is very difficult because my father became a Dutch citizen exactly one month before Hitler came to power, which means that um, theoretically I'm not eligible to become a citizen of, of Germany, and so. Um, somebody at the consulate has been helping me and trying to find papers and to find loopholes and all kinds of ways of getting around that. So far, we haven't been succeeded. But um, I know that there are a lot of people who are trying to get German citizenship. And 
I think that the Germans are quite helpful. Yeah. yeah. Doreen, our last question for you is what do you feel are the lessons of your family's experiences in the Holocaust? Um, you know, uh, over time I have met many Holocaust survivors and I've seen that people come away from it with, a very, with diff very different views. Some um, kind of pull into themselves and say you know, and, and prote protect themselves. And, and, and the phrase never again is the one that I cling to because for me, never again means not just to Jews, but not to anybody. And so uh, my view is that curiosity about other people and generosity to other people is the way to, for it, for it never to happen again. Of course, it has happened again in many ways, in many places, but I, uh, I honestly don't see how this world can survive that way. And so for me, the only possible way to, to move ahead is by generosity and curiosity. That's such a beautiful note to end on. And there is so much generosity in your story from others who helped you and curiosity in your story as you learned other people's experiences and reconstructed your own families. And we're very grateful that you shared what you know and remember with us today. And there's a lot that we'll take away from listening to you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today in the audience. Uh, everything we do at the Museum of Jewish Heritage is made possible through donor support. So please consider making a contribution in support of the museum's work to preserve stories like the Grinvan families and join us for our upcoming programs and events, including our monthly Story Survive series. We did record today's presentation and conversation with Doreen Grunbaum, and we'll email out a recording tomorrow, along with some other links, including Joseph Pollack's book, which she mentioned. Uh, stay well, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Doreen, thank you again.